deeply regrets this incident. By July 1988, the Straits of Hormuz in the Persian Gulf had become a shooting gallery for shipping caught up in the war between Iran and Iraq. For six years, ships had been attacked by both sides. The principal targets, super tankers carrying oil from the Gulf. When Iran increased its attacks, the United States moved in strength to protect the international waterway. We were there to protect US national interests. We escorted tanker convoys in and out of the Gulf. There was no question about it, no, no hesitancy on our part to do that, to fulfill the mission. Early in the morning of the 3rd of July, 1988, the USS Vincennes moved into the Persian Gulf. It was the most advanced missile cruiser in the US Navy, equipped with Aegis, a system which allowed the ship to deal with hundreds of incoming targets at the same time. The Vincennes Combat Information Center was its brain. This was a sophisticated ship designed to protect a surface fleet from air attack. The idea of putting the Vincennes in the Gulf was, uh, was not something that everyone in the Navy was comfortable with. It's a very crowded environment. So it's just crisscross with their traffic quarters. There are very few places you can go where you're not in one or near one uh, in the Persian Gulf. And that was not the optimal situation for that kind of ship. The Vincennes had only been in the Gulf for a few weeks. In that short time, it had already acquired something of a reputation. One of the lieutenants on the Nicholas uh, told me that uh, they didn't think highly of the Vincennes and that the ship was considered uh, trigger happy, uh, sometimes referred to as the robo cruiser. We had heard terms like robo cruiser and things like that, but uh, that didn't mean much to us at the time. The captain of the Vincennes, Will Rogers, was seen as a man hungry for action and on the fast track to the coveted rank of Admiral. We remain alert and we'll stay alert. Uh, but at the same time, I don't want to uh, uh, ever give the impression that we're leaning forward on our toes to, uh, to get a major conflagration start here. That's not the case at all. The main danger to regular Gulf shipping came from lightly armed Iranian Revolutionary Guard speedboats known as bog hammers. These bog hammers also carried a rack of rocket launchers on their bows called Katusha rockets. And those are basically uh, dumb rockets. They're like a, a firecracker. They have a warhead. They have no guidance system. They're just a ballistic projectile once you fire them. Putting them on a boat is pretty stupid. What they were using them for, they'd go up beside these super tankers, get real close and fire a couple of these small rockets, and it would hit the ship, you know, burn the paint off, maybe put a little hole in it, but really not do much damage. It was harassment. Uh, so they weren't really a threat to us. Pound for pound and throw weight for throw weight, there really isn't any comparison. But I, I think when you, you have to take things into the context of what we have here in the Gulf, the fact that, uh, you know, small craft are always difficult targets, uh, uh, a dedicated attack by anyone who wants to press it home is a difficult problem to deal with. Uh, regardless of the capabilities of the defender. Mines laid by the Iranians in the Gulf Sea lanes were considered the greatest danger to shipping. The Americans believed it was an Iranian mine which badly damaged one of their frigates. This provoked a major response from the USA and in their biggest surface naval action since World War II, the US targeted specific Iranian oil platforms and destroyed them. The operation was named Praying Mantis. U.S. naval forces sank half the Iranian Navy. Tension was high. When the USS Vincennes sailed west through the Straits of Hormuz, it was entering a war zone. The Persian Gulf has always been one of the most sensitive areas in the world. It's dominated by Iran, who, along with the state of Amman, controls the Straits of Hormuz, choke point of the world's oil supplies. As the Vincennes entered the Persian Gulf, the USS Montgomery was already on station. The USS Sides would enter the Straits shortly after. On board the Vincennes, there happened to be a Navy TV crew who were making an official history of the US involvement in the tanker war. The BBC has obtained both the original film of the incident and original sound recordings of radio communications. 
they provide unique witness to the build-up and shoot-down of a civilian airliner. Without a doubt, the Vincennes incident began uh, when the Karama Maris called for assistance on the night of July the 2nd. That led to a chain of events that ultimately ended in the Vincennes shooting down a commercial airliner. On July the 2nd, the Karama Maersk uh, was transiting the Straits of Hormuz and sent out a distress call. The Montgomery was the closest ship in the area and we went to her aid. We did circle the Karama Maersk a number of times and identified a vessel and fired a warning shot. So it was the Montgomery which initiated the first action, not the state-of-the-art Vincennes. From other ships' perspectives, I'm sure it was very significant. Here, here you have an older uh, class of ship, a Knox-class frigate, one of the oldest in the line. And we're the ones that were the first to initiate action. We escorted the Karama Maris the remainder of the way out of the Persian Gulf. Um, the gunboats that we um, believed had harassed the Karama Maris were still in the area, and we did track... Uh, approximately 12 to 15 small contacts in the straits which we knew sooner or later would be back out in the shipping channels harassing uh, vessels again and they maintained a range of between five and ten miles behind us the entire time even after we met up with the Vincennes. The USS Sides, the third American warship in this story, a guided missile frigate, was re-entering the Persian Gulf. On the morning of um, July the 3rd, we were coming back through the Straits of Hormuz uh, on the way to pick up another ship for an Ernest Will escort mission. And um, there, was, uh, there was some radio communications indicating sounds of explosions or such coming from Montgomery and, uh, and, and Vincennes. The impression at the time was that these explosions were fairly large and not explainable uh, in the immediate vicinity. You know, in other words, there were no, there were no units that uh, you could attribute uh, this size of an explosion to. The explosions might have meant that some merchant ships could be in danger from Iranian bog hammers. So the Vincennes went to investigate, determined this time not to miss out on the chance of action. But even on the Montgomery itself, the explosions remain something of a mystery. At some point, and I'm not sure exactly when, um, the CIC officer did come to the bridge. I was on the bridge at the time as the junior officer of the deck and asked me if I heard several, con several explosions um, coming from somewhere in the distance, and I told him that I had heard nothing. Good morning. This is the Dalgiri carrier to fly. When the Vincennes made contact with the Dalgiri, it required no assistance. Reports of explosions were baseless. German merchant Uligari, this is U.S. Navy warship. We are standing by channel 16. Over. Uh, yeah, okay, 16. Uh, do you read me? Merchant Uligari, this is U.S. Navy warship. We you loud and clear. Over. Okay, thank you. The Dalgiri and other merchant ships may have felt safe, but the Vincennes still saw the bog hammers as a threat. Radio messages from the Amani Navy warned off Iranian bog hammers from Amani waters. This is Omar Navy. Iranian Revolutionary Guard patrol boats maneuvering at speed. Your actions are not to be to the right of passage. Leave Omani territorial waters immediately. Now, the Vincennes began to shadow the bog hammers. The Amanis considered this highly provocative and ordered Vincennes out of their territorial waters. This is U.S. Navy warship, over. Your actions in maneuvering at speed up to 30 knots in Omani waters are not in accordance with the rights of innocent passage. You to maintain a constant heading at leave Omani waters, over. United States Navy warship, uh, Roger, stand by. Left three degrees, Roger, City course zero one five five. Roger, left three degrees, come course zero one five. The Vincennes complied and left Omani waters. But contrary to instructions from the U.S. Surface Commander, it also moved to support the USS Montgomery, which was close to an active Boghammer group. I did not send the Vincennes to, to support the Montgomery. I sent 
I authorized the Vincennes to send their helo. I was the only one that was in authority to send them anywhere, and my understanding was that they had asked permission to cover uh, the area with the helicopter and that they were also told to remain on station. The Vincennes helicopter, call sign Ocean Lord, was sent to monitor the bog hammers. We don't know how close to the boats the helicopter actually went. There was, without getting too technical, a fixed distance that they were supposed to maintain. Uh, if, in fact, they were harassing the boats, which may have been the case, how would the boats communicate with them? Well, they would generally fire warning shots. We'd seen that happen with news helicopters there in the past. If the news helicopters or the media helicopters got too close to Iranian uh, small boats, bog hammers, if you will, or whatever, um, warning shots uh, would be fired and had been fired in the past. I heard uh, what sounded to me like uh, machine gun fire uh, over my right shoulder, and I turned around and watched the helicopter fly back to the Vincennes from the general direction of the gunboats. Shortly thereafter, the Hilo reported taking shots, or I should say that the Vincennes reported to me that the Hilo had reported taking shots. Under the rules of engagement, the Vincennes could now engage with the Iranians. She contacted her surface commander in Bahrain. Were they warning shots or were they actually attacked? The helicopter wasn't hit after all, and the helicopter could escape the area at great speed, and in fact it did. So therefore, what was Vincennes up to in going to general quarters, accelerating to maximum speed, and heading off to those boats, which at the time presented no threat to anyone? General quarters, general quarters, all hands man your battle stations. The Vincennes took tactical control of the Montgomery. Um, we turned around, closed the contacts. Uh, Vincennes requested permission from the commanders in the Gulf uh, to engage the bog hammers, um, the Iranian gunboats. <laughs> The rules of engagement at the time uh, specified, and they, and they were very clear-cut, that uh, you will return fire with fire. And, uh, and so uh, uh, they, they asked permission to uh, take the units under fire. Uh, I gave permission and reported the same to Commander of Mideast Horse. 75 kilometers away in Bandar Abbas, passengers were boarding Iran Air 655, a regular flight to Dubai. Cruising at maximum speed after the bog hammers, the Vincennes soon faced a potential problem. Officer deck, presently hold the ship, crossing the Iranian declared war zone line. Having crossed the Iranian war zone line into territorial waters, international law permitted the Vincennes to fire only in self-defense. Do they have any guns on it? We did take the 12 mile limit seriously. Uh, everybody was uh, very concerned about it. Uh, incurring into uh, the uh, 12 mile limit was verboten. And uh, people were supposed to hold short of this uh, 12 mile limit by several miles to prevent that from happening. In fact, the Vincennes log shows that it had crossed into Iranian territorial waters over 10 times in the previous four weeks. It was our concern, however, that, that uh, Vincennes was acting in an overly aggressive fashion, or so it seemed, and that they were actually pursuing these boats uh, rather than uh, being pursued by them. The IRGC were sort of a, a ragamuffin band, if you will. I mean, they were, they were not very well coordinated, and certainly it wouldn't be too difficult to scare them, I don't think, into doing something that was foolhardy. If they saw a lot of military machinery bearing down on them, they could easily become uh, frightened. 
It was our business out there to defend shipping against those guys, but not to provoke them. It was hammered home to us that, uh, that we were the neutrals, that we were in a very difficult position, that, uh, that uh, restraint was there, but if, that if you needed to have uh, the use of the rules of engagement, so be it. They were, they were there for you to protect yourself and your crews. In support of the Vincennes, fighters were launched from a nearby carrier. Enormous firepower to deal with lightly armed speedboats. The Montgomery also opened fire. engagement with the small boats the aircraft lifts off from Bandar Abbas and then proceeds on course essentially slightly off schedule as has been noted I think they were 20 minutes or so behind schedule um, climbing on on a fixed course using the proper IFF and so forth and so on every aircraft broadcasts its own unique identity by transmitting an electronic squawk code IFF identification friend or foe the Airbus continually broadcast its civilian status. The aircraft was proceeding on a course that would take it directly over the Vincennes position. R recall again that Vincennes was in the middle of a, a, a gun battle with these small boats. Now, perhaps a battle of its own making, but firing nonetheless. The Vincennes still carried on firing, though they were well inside Iranian territorial waters. The Airbus was now 24 kilometres along the regular air route to Dubai. It had already been wrongly identified as hostile. The Vincennes believed it to be an Iranian F-14 fighter. You are inundated with intelligence messages, projecting the worst case scenario possible every day of the week, such that if anything happened whatsoever, they could go back to the file and pull out a warning that said, well, we've warned them about that. But life in the Gulf was business as usual. Commerce continued, airliners continued to fly back and forth. If you allowed yourself to focus solely on those intelligence reports without going up on deck, walking around and looking at the reality of life in the Persian Gulf, you could become quite paranoid about threats that didn't exist. But there had already been official concern that tensions might affect military judgment. 
when I uh, uh, briefed in with, uh, with the commander of uh, the Mideast Force, I know that a very serious concern of his, as a matter of fact, he said, uh, Dick, uh, the one thing uh, that I am concerned about is uh, shooting down a, a, a civilian aircraft. If Captain Rogers believed it was a military aircraft, and if he believed, as we think he did, that it was part of a coordinated effort at that point, a coordinated attack, uh, then, then in his mind, uh, he could see this as a threat. At this point, the Vincennes had already issued the Airbus three warnings. Two of these could not be received by the civilian airliner as they were broadcast on military frequencies. And the third warning did not identify the aircraft as it failed to use any IFF squawk code. I was told that it was an F-14. I watched it. I took a look at its altitude and its speed. Um, it was climbing. It was slow. It was in the middle of our missile envelope. The F-14, to my knowledge, had no significant anti-surface warfare capability, so I designated this thing in my own mind as a non-threat. Captain Rogers, on the other hand, involved with his uh, gun battle at that time, announces that he is intent on taking that aircraft out at 20 miles. It got tense. It did uh, make the situation uh, much more complicated. Both ships had attempted to communicate with uh, the aircraft, and we were unsuccessful. We got no um, response back. We could hear the challenges go out on military air distress and the civilian version of air, the air distress uh, channels. Um, so we were aware that they were warning an aircraft, an approaching aircraft. Typically, if you could not communicate with an Iranian um, airplane, military aircraft, you illuminated them with your fire control radar, you let them know that you were there, and they would generally depart the area. When we illuminated it with our fire control radar, it didn't react. The American fighters launched earlier could have identified the airliner as a civilian flight but the carrier commander would not allow them to approach the area, fearing they might be shot down by an overeager Vincennes. I did not have the capability to talk directly to the commanding officer of Vincennes, simply because he was engaged on a very personal basis in a fight. And I knew they were about ready to pull a trigger on a missile that could kill my pilots. And I wanted to make absolutely certain that they didn't become the victim. Air hostile at 004, true, 21 miles. The aircraft crosses the 20 mile uh, mark and he doesn't shoot it down. 18. So at that point, I breathed a sigh of relief, thinking that, ah, okay, he has now seen that it is a non threat. The size is right here? Size. Okay. What I'm told transpired during that period of time afterwards is that they, they weren't capable of getting the shot off in an orderly fashion. So although the intent was to shoot it down at 20 miles, um, they, they sort of bungled the operation. While the surface battle continued, the crew below struggled to fire their missiles before the aircraft came so close that a successful launch would be impossible. 27 unsuccessful attempts were made before the correct launch code was entered. created an uproar on the ship, which was quickly quieted down. Combat, this is Stinger. Do you have any more air contacts in the vicinity? That's a negative, Stinger. No inbound air contact. The Vincennes continued to pound the bog hammers. All right, have we got a confirmed kill on that one yet, Well, uh, it looks like it's us, and then the guy was there, and then he was gone. We gave that guy his wish. He went to see all of us. I didn't see a parachute in the plane, either. We uh, had individuals who were up 
in places where they could see wreckage fall and they could see the airplane coming down. It wasn't until sometime later that they described the wreckage in terms that led us to believe that it was not a military aircraft. It was too much, too large. And over the emergency frequency, they heard a desperate Iranian appeal. They had shot down an Iranian airliner, but critically, while in Iranian waters. I can just only recollect the, uh, the pall that settled over the entire force when it, it started to become apparent that this was an airliner that was involved. It was just a, a sickening feeling for the entire uh, rest of the day. I can't ever remember being so dismayed, so depressed, so uh, feeling for all of the people that were involved. Uh, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a very happy day uh, in the Gulf for us, that's for sure. The sides was dispatched to go close to, the, to uh, uh, Dubai to see if they could find wreckage, and uh, they spent a considerable amount of time. There was nothing there. And uh, it's also fairly ironic that the Vincennes is the one that came upon the wreckage. This was hardly surprising, as the Airbus and its dead were in Iranian waters, only a few kilometers from where the Vincennes had shot it down. It was the middle of the night when the news was sent to Washington, a time difference of seven hours with the Gulf. The shoot-down was a major incident with enormous diplomatic implications, and so the Navy had to prepare itself for a rough ride. Admiral William Crow, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, was sent out to face the press. After receiving further data and evaluating information available from the Persian Gulf, we believe that the cruiser USS Vincennes, while actively engaged with threatening Iranian surface units and protecting itself from what was concluded to be a hostile aircraft, shot down an Iranian airliner over the Straits of Hormuz. The U.S. government deeply regrets this incident. Given the threatening flight profile and the decreasing range, the aircraft was declared hostile. Vincennes fired two standard surface-to-air missiles, at least one of which hit at an approximate range of six miles. Admiral Crow presented the facts as the Vincennes had reported, claiming the aircraft had been diving in an attack mode outside its correct air lane and that it had not responded to any warnings. This was the story that the world and America first heard. An official investigation of the incident will be conducted by Rear Admiral William N. Fogarty, United States Navy of the U.S. Central Command. Within a day, the Pentagon knew it had another problem, the version of the incident reported to them by the USS sides. It's climbing. It's slow. It doesn't respond. It's in the middle of the, our missile envelope, basically. It's vulnerable. Why would this aircraft present a threat that did not meet any of the uh, threat parameters that were necessary? There were more problems for the Pentagon when the initial readings of the Vincennes computer tapes contradicted what they'd just said. These confirmed what the sides had reported. The aircraft in question had been ascending at a steady speed. It should have presented no threat to Vincennes. Even so, when the Fogarty report was published, Iran was pronounced guilty. An examination of the events on 3 July leads quickly to the conclusion that Iran must share the responsibility for tragedy and the investigation so found. By any measure, it was unconscionable to ignore the repeated warnings of the United States and permit an airliner to take off from a joint military-civilian airfield and fly directly into the midst of the ongoing surface action in the Strait of Hormuz which the Iranians themselves had initiated. 
We now have a complete report. But in fact, the report was far from complete. A very complex story. It still didn't admit that the Vincennes had been inside Iranian waters. But all the other contradictions were explained away by the concept of scenario fulfillment, a sort of mass delusion. Everybody interviewed in the combat center said that the plane was descending toward the Vincennes. But the electronic record shows it never descended toward the Vincennes. But everybody had that view. I mean, they totally deluded themselves as to the nature of the threat. The scenario fulfillment concept avoided awkward questions, but the reports of the original psychologists who interviewed the crew of the Combat Information Centre stated that for six people to share the same delusion was, in their words, highly implausible. The biggest problem you have in doing any investigation is that the guy who commits the mistake, or uh, whether it be an honest error or whether it be uh, 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 a grievous uh, error, um, lies to his superiors to cover his own butt. When the Vincennes returned to its home port of San Diego, it was to a hero's welcome. All the crew were to receive combat action ribbons for their service in the Persian Gulf. In the United States, it's a great place uh, to, to be a military officer. And one reason is that when an incident like this comes along, the vast majority of the American uh, people are going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Four years later, it was first admitted to the American public that the Vincennes had been in Iranian waters. An earlier report from ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, sparked new press revelations. Admiral Crow was asked to explain himself at a hearing at the House Armed Services Committee, chaired by Les Aspen. Perhaps at the time of the IKO release, we should have declassified the ship's position and issued a press release pointing out Vincennes' location within Iranian waters at the time of firing. With a prescience of 2020 hindsight, I wish we had done that. Crow read his 26-page statement, then he was cross-examined by the committee. The Fogarty report had stated the chain of events which led to the shootdown began with distress calls from merchant ships. How do you explain, Admiral, the uh, discrepancy that everything started in response to distress calls, and yet the Fogarty report later confirmed that it turned out that there were no distress calls? I don't think I can explain, Congressman. I think he misspoke. Mr. Fogarty? Yes. Uh, I've talked to him about it. He doesn't remember it. Uh, I, I cannot reconcile at time. There were just too many unanswered questions, so the chairman, Les Aspen, decided they needed answering. He appointed Warren Nelson to conduct a new investigation. I spent an immense amount of time, probably the bulk of my time, looking at all the tracks and the various documentation that had been done on the tracks and, and how uncertain that evidence is Evidence which included the helicopter incident that sparked the whole firefight and the subsequent shootdown. In the case of the helicopter, we're basically dependent upon interpretation of people who were in the plane, and and the interpretations didn't agree. Uh, were they were they confused by some reflections? I mean, at the bottom line is they aren't sure. <laughs> there is no way of saying that they were fired at definitely. There's no way of saying they weren't fired at. That's just one of these big question marks in history. Most of the question marks could have been cleared up if the airliner's black boxes had been found, crucially, the cockpit voice recorder. The Iranians were out there and, and brought in a, a lot of refuse, luggage, bodies, whole sections of the aircraft they've got on shore. Uh, and said they were hunting for the black box as well and said they never found it. Uh, you know, one line of speculation has been the Iranians found it, discovered there were recordings on it showing the plane received the warnings and therefore destroyed it. I don't believe that because I don't believe the pilot would ignore the warnings. I mean, it's, it's just too ridiculous. Even if the pilots had heard warnings, 
they wouldn't have paid attention since their aircraft was not identified. The warnings were addressed to fighter, Iranian F-14, and unidentified aircraft. The Airbus pilots knew that they were none of these. The message sent from the sides just under a minute before the missiles hit was the only one which the crew could have recognised as describing the Airbus. Only the black boxes could prove this one way or the other. They might have shown a message had been received and something done about it, or no messages received at all. If the Iranians didn't recover the black boxes, who else would have wanted them? The BBC, after numerous requests and appeals, finally obtained a CIA document listed as evidence in the official report. It was entitled, Recovery of Black Boxes, Persian Gulf. Every one of the report's five pages was completely blacked out, other than the words secret and no foreigner. So what were they trying to hide? Perhaps the answer lies in a briefing document used in an internal Pentagon inquiry into the Fogarty report. It showed the last few minutes of the Airbus based on the Vincennes computer tapes. It shows the aircraft following the correct commercial air route. Using the correct squawk code, the sides broadcast the only message the Airbus could possibly have understood. At this point, the aircraft conspicuously diverts from its scheduled flight path, away from the warships. A minute later, the plane appears to veer more sharply to the right, onto the course advised by the sides. The missiles are fired and the aircraft disappears from the radar screen. I think, uh, and I believe deeply, that had there been one American on that aircraft, that, that the story would have gone on from there. But sadly, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a macabre way, sadly, uh, there wasn't. And so, so consequently, there wasn't any drive to get to the bottom of the story. And the new investigation, headed by Warren Nelson, simply petered out. Other things seemed more important. The reason why there was no final report is exclusively my fault. We didn't produce any further document, although we wanted to, and, and, and I just I got bogged down with something else that erupted. I forget what it was. The really sad part of this whole thing, in my opinion, is the, the lack of taking responsibility for what happened. I view the entire affair as a, as a gigantic screw-up. And yet, uh, once we got through the preliminary investigation in Bahrain conducted by Admiral Fogarty, we hear not a word of it from there on out. Um, why is that? Well, I, I find it interesting that, that, um, th that we took no further action. It seems to me it was plain that it was a tremendous mistake, a giant blunder. At that point, it would seem to me that we should have addressed it as a giant blunder, held people accountable, uh, taken corrective action, and, uh, and I believe um, we should have apologized to the Iranians for it. Captain Rogers declined the BBC's request for an interview. He said that while he regretted the outcome, he would do exactly the same thing again in the same circumstances. Captain Will Rogers was awarded a Legion of Merit medal for his meritorious performance on the Vincennes. News of the shoot-down stunned in Iran, already worn out by eight years of war. The Iranian leadership was convinced that it had been a deliberate act of war by America, and their suspicions were understandable. It was an undeclared war with Iran. We were in hostile action with their armed forces, and we sank, we sought out and sank uh, Iranian state naval vessels. I mean, to me, that's, that's certainly uh, a state of war, whether it's declared or not. Immediately, there were calls for revenge. The official Iranian response was menacing, but unspecific. 
we will, of course, in due course, have our own response to the American crimes. I do not disclose what kind of response uh, would be from our side, but naturally an appropriate and major response to the magnitude of the crime. Six months later, it seemed possible those words had taken on a truly sinister meaning. When Pan Am 103 blew up over Lockerbie, there was speculation about Iranian extremists, their known links to international terrorist Ahmad Jabril, and revenge. Investigators switched attention to Libya, and the US now seeks not to antagonize Iran as a counterweight to Iraq. But suspicions have lingered. The two Libyans accused of the bombing recently had their trial adjourned. Defence lawyers are reviewing evidence that may shift the focus back to Iran. I think that it's altogether possible that, um, that the Lockerbie uh, disaster could be linked to the Vincennes uh, tragedy. And that might not have happened, uh, again this is speculation, that that might not have happened had we taken the appropriate steps to apologise for the problem and to let the Iranians uh, know that it was in fact a giant blunder. I wouldn't say that I think about it every day, but yes, from time to time, um, it does come back because it set off a chain of events that, that's going on even today. Uh, 290 that were on the civilian airliner, plus Pan Am Flight 103 over Lockerbie, Scotland, killed 270 people. That's a staggering body count. In Washington's Arlington Cemetery, there's a memorial to the Lockerbie dead. They were the victims of terror, but was that terror random or the final act of an undeclared war in the Persian Gulf?